Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week is actually the Lyme Regis Fossil Festival, which takes place this weekend on the 8th and 9th of June. And we're going. Ben and I are both going to be there to take in all the fossil festivities and hopefully we'll see a few of you there. Starting off the news this week, the James Webb Space Telescope has given us yet another glimpse at a previously unreachable part of our universe. Researchers working on the James Webb Space Telescope Extragalactic Survey, or JADES, have discovered the most distant galaxy ever. As looking deep into space is essentially looking deep into time, as the light from what we're looking at takes time to reach us, this galaxy is also the earliest that has ever been observed becoming what we see now just 290 million years after the Big Bang, which, in cosmological terms, is a very, very short time indeed. The James Webb Space Telescope took a look at some other very early galaxies back at the end of 2022, the previous record holders. Those galaxies, and especially this new one, have actually presented a bit of a problem for astronomers who previously widely thought that galaxies so big and bright would not have formed in the universe that early. This particular record-breaking find is yet more evidence towards the idea that luminous galaxies weren't even massively rare this early on. Strangely enough, our new earliest galaxy isn't being observed at its very beginning. Its brightness and the presence of a large amount of oxygen detected suggests that the galaxy has actually been around for a long time, and the universe's first stars, which were probably rather massive but short-lived, have already started to expunge their contents as their life cycles complete within their galaxy. One astronomer told the BBC that such a galaxy could have been spotted with Earth's swanky new tech if it were ten times as faint, which of course means that there are likely many more distant and earlier galaxies to be found. Another bit of fantastic news from data gathered from the JWST, it's been amazing to follow its progress over the last couple of years and how it's been rewriting the way we look at how the universe evolved in its very earliest days. In other news, a fern from the island of New Caledonia has, under analysis, been found to have a larger genome than any other living thing ever discovered. A team working at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Key, West London, brought samples back from the island, which is a small French overseas territory in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, to analyse back in the UK. It was found to have a genome size of 160.45 GBP. Not great British pounds, of course, but billion base pairs, which are the building blocks of the double helix which so characterises the image of DNA. To give you an idea of just how massive that is, remember this fern has a genome size of 160.45 GBP, humans have a genome size of just 3.2 GBP. While this fern, called Timesipteris oblanceolata, is a whopping 7% larger than the previous record holder for the largest genome, ferns and many other plants often have incredibly large genomes compared to other organisms, and it's not entirely known why. It's not even fully understood how these organisms can survive with so much DNA, and this new record-breaking plant will doubtless inspire new research to help us understand more about these organisms, which could, in turn, help us when it comes to conservation efforts for these species or ones like it. And moving from the largest back to the oldest, we have a new study published in the journal Nature Geoscience that has looked to find just how far back we have to go to find the emergence of meteoric water, or fresh water, on Earth. This is important in trying to understand exactly how early in Earth's life cycle life originated. Currently, the oldest evidence we have for life is about 3.5 billion years old, but we know that life needs water, and indeed the water cycle that would occur after fresh water emerged with the Earth's crust. So, working out when this began can act as a furthest back estimate for when life may have started to pop up. The researchers analysed the oxygen molecules within the zircon crystals found in some of the oldest rock formations on Earth, and found evidence for fresh water on our planet 4 billion years ago. This isn't a hard set date, it could have turned up before this, but we now know that it was just around 600 million years after the Earth's formation, which, speaking geology, isn't really that long. 
I suppose this really hammers home just how early that galaxy from the beginning of the video was observed. That was a somewhat mature galaxy that took less than half the time to get to that stage than the time we know freshwater appeared on Earth after it formed. An incredible insight into the beginning of our planet then, and yet further knowledge gained on when our extremely distant ancestors came to be. Also in the news, a recently published paper highlights the increasingly difficult time harbour porpoises are facing. These diminutive marine mammals are one of the smallest cetaceans in the world, reaching to a length of 1.4 to 2 metres and weighing only 55 to 75 kilograms. They are found in the coastal waters of the sub-Arctic and cool temperature waters of the North Atlantic and North Pacific. There is a population of harbour porpoises which inhabit an area of sea surrounded by Norway, Denmark and Sweden called Kattegat. For many years, the population was stable, with around 40,000 individuals. But in recent times, this number has fallen to only 14,000. Like all cetaceans, they face issues such as entanglement in fishing nets and pollution, but these harbour porpoises are also predated on by grey seals and the population of these is increasing in Kattegat. Their small size and cold surroundings mean that they have a high metabolic rate in order for them to maintain their body temperature. As a consequence of this, they need to eat a lot of their prey. They mainly hunt small fish both from the pelagic and benthic environment and need to catch around 2,000 fish a day. This means that they spend a lot of time hunting and as there are fewer and smaller fish available as prey, their time spent hunting has had to increase. Scientists placed multi-sensor tags on some individuals from this population and found that porpoises spend 62% of their time engaged in foraging dives. 65% of feeding dives actually occurred at night. The study also revealed that the porpoises are vulnerable to noise from motorboats and will stop feeding when they are around. If this happens a couple of times a day, then the impact on porpoises is not too great. But the sound of motorboats was recorded by the tags 80% of the time. Action needs to be taken to conserve this population and it is proposed that zones where motorboats are prohibited would help the animals and for boats to go at a steady speed and not change direction suddenly. Let us hope that some safeguards can be put in place before numbers of this cetacean decrease any further. First up in the paleontology news for this week, an interesting new study has revised what we know about prehistoric giant flightless birds from Australia. These birds, members of a family called Dromornithinidae, are also known as thunderbirds and even demon ducks, as they grew to huge sizes, reaching a maximum of about 3 metres in height, or about 9 foot 10. Fortunately, they were primarily herbivorous, and they lived from around 25 million years ago up until just a few tens of thousands of years ago. This new paper re-describes the skull anatomy of a species of dromornithid called Geniornis newtoni. Originally named in 1896, presenting data from better preserved skull material found since then and also examining muscle placements and addressing issues of dromornithid classification. The new research shows that Geniornis had a wide jaw gape, a powerful bite and a fine control of the upper and lower bills, plus adaptations for watery habitats that allowed them to submerge their heads. The upper jaw was tall, mobile and had an interesting cask structure on it, with the paleontologists describing it as looking quite like a goose's jaw. The researchers also find evidence to support the classification of the dromornithids within or close to the South American screamers, as well as the magpie goose of Australia. Essentially then, Geniornis was a lot like an enormous, two metre tall goose. Also in the recent paleo news, a new species of sauropodomorph dinosaur has been named. Called Musanqua sanyatiensis, it was discovered in late Triassic aged rocks in Zimbabwe that dates to about 210 million years ago. It's known from a partial right hind limb, which display many features indicating it's a new kind of massapodan dinosaur, meaning it's a basal member of the group of dinosaurs that also includes the giant sauropods, which would later become the largest animals ever to walk the earth. Musanqua is named after the houseboat that the paleontologists used as a home and mobile lab while excavating the dinosaur, 
while the species named Sanyati ensis is in reference to the Sanyati River. Musankwa is only the fourth dinosaur to be named from rocks of this age in Zimbabwe, and the first to be named from the mid-Zambezi basin in more than 50 years. Hopefully, more amazing dinosaur discoveries will be made in the region. Up next, new research has been published investigating the anatomy and size of the largest belemnites, prehistoric squid-like cephalopods that inhabited the oceans when dinosaurs were around. The biggest belemnites known to us are species of the genus Megatuthis, which lived during the Jurassic. This new research looked at exceptional fossils preserving the soft parts of belemnite anatomy in various different species to see what the body proportions of these cephalopods were like and then applied this data to fossils found of the hard parts of Megatoithus. The researchers found that the largest fossils indicated a maximum mantle length of up to 1.76 metres, about 5.8 feet, for Megatoithus. Full body lengths, with the arms included, were also found to be up to 2.17 metres, 7.1 feet, for a shorter and more robust Megatoithus species, while a more slender but longer species may have reached almost 3.11 metres, 10.2 feet. The exact anatomy of the soft fins of Megatoithus is still unknown, but it's thought to have had an overall similar look to a smaller but better known Jurassic belemnite. These maximum dimensions would therefore put some Megatoithus species among the 10 largest modern coleoid cephalopods, so these were incredibly impressive animals. Also in the news, new research has shown that the late Triassic age Dicynodont Placarius from the Chinle Formation of Arizona shows evidence of sexual dimorphism in their tusk-like projections. The idea that these structures differ between males and females of this species has been around for a long time, but this study has now statistically confirmed that there is indeed a difference. The projections, which are actually extensions of the upper jaw bones, are known as caniniform processes, and based on a sample of these animals, the paleontologists found that there are two distinct morphs of these processes, one being shorter than the other. These projections were therefore potentially used in threat displays and even intraspecific combat, with males fighting one another, similar to how modern-day bovids compete for dominance. And finally, for the news this week, we couldn't end without mentioning the incredibly exciting announcement that Walking with Dinosaurs is returning. 25 years after the original series aired, the BBC is releasing six episodes of a new series exploring the lives of individual dinosaurs based on their actual fossil remains. According to what's been said so far, these will include a Spinosaurus roaming around the ancient rivers of Morocco, a young Triceratops and its fight against a T-Rex, and the sauropod Lusotitan risking it all for love in Portugal. It's coming out at some point in 2025 and we're all very excited about it, Ben especially so, who's looking forward to doing some more accuracy reviews on it in another 10 years or so. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed and, as always, we might genuinely see you on Sunday. <laughs>